Well, here we are. We're, we're coming back to a wave equation development uh, from a stress strain point of view. And hopefully you had um, a chance to maybe give it a try to see if you could come up with the uh, wave equation based on what we had discussed before. I'll just kind of go briefly go over the diagram here um, uh, just, just to set things up again. And I'll you know just note that the in the diagram here that we have a, a an initial volume element here which is uh, has a length u in the x direction and a surface area a so its volume is u d a and after def deformation again the displacement here is exaggerated just just for visualization purpose but uh, we have a deformed length now of u plus d u in the x direction. And we have the stress on this face initially of s of x. Uh, after displacement of that face, a distance dx, it, we have a stress s of x plus dx on that uh, same face. So the net force, again, uh, on this volume element, uh, dx dA, uh, this, this volume element that we're looking at now, uh, the differences in the stresses on the faces before and after deformation uh, times the uh, area. So we have the force would be S of x plus dx minus S of x times dA, which gives us the mass times the acceleration, or rho, the density, times the volume, dx dA, uh, times the acceleration, d2u dt squared. So now if we look at that relationship, we're just uh, setting an equivalence between those two terms. We have s of x plus dx minus s of x times the surface area. That gives us a force. That's equal to the mass times the acceleration, or rho dx dA times the acceleration. And then we're just dividing both sides by dx dA. Uh, that gives us uh, s of x plus dx minus s of x over dx. And of course the dx dA cancels out, and we have the density times d2u dt squared. So this is just equal to ds dx. And as shown earlier, this stress here that we have on this uh, face uh, is equal to, and this we, we're using the uh, stress on a surface whose normal was pointed in the x direction, so we have the uh, stress in the x direction is equal to the Young's modulus times du dx. And we're just going to substitute this into this relationship here. We have ds dx. So we'll substitute for uh, s equal to e du dx. And that gives us e d2u dx squared is equal to rho d2u dt squared. So once again, we come up with a familiar looking relationship between the second spatial derivative and the second temporal derivative. Um, here again, this thinking back to the previous videos on the wave equation development, this term is 1 over v squared. So that gives us a velocity equal to the square root of e over rho, or the square root of Young's modulus over the density. So we come up with yet another um, relationship between the second spatial derivative of uh, second spatial derivative and the second temporal derivative. And here I'm just uh, going to kind of briefly note a presentation by Dobern and Savitt who developed this in a, a 3D version of the wave equation. And they don't provide all the details as well, but note that this uh, delta V here, this uh, theta that's referred to in this, relation, this uh, relationship over here is it's, it's the uh, cubical dilatation, or epsilon sub x plus epsilon sub y plus epsilon sub z that we mentioned in the uh, last video. So that's basically our delta v. So we're looking at the, spatial, the second spatial derivative of the, the volume changes in the x, y, and z direction. And uh, for a compressional wave, in this case, uh, we come up with uh, a constant over here, which is rho over lambda plus 2 mu times the uh, uh, second temporal derivative. And we can also develop this uh, for shear strains so that we get uh, alpha 
uh, instead of theta, and we have second spatial derivatives in the x, y, and z direction equal to rho over mu uh, d2 alpha dt squared. So remember again, these are the velocities, so we can see that the velocity is going to be equal to the square root of uh, the reciprocal of this, or the, the shear wave velocity to the square root of the reciprocal of this. But let's note that the notation that we're using up here, uh, we've got the divergence of the gradient up here, and, and this is just a Laplacian, so we could write this as del squared theta is equal to rho over lambda plus 2 mu times the second spatial derivative, or, um, and this should be alpha, uh, sorry about that, um, but this should be uh, del squared alpha would be equal to rho over mu d2 squared, d squared alpha over dt squared. So we have these uh, two, we have this kind of condensed representation, and again, apologies, this should be an alpha. Uh, but again, just note that we've come up with some additional representations of this velocity in this particular case because we've done this for compressional waves and shear waves separately. And we've looked at the volume. <coughs> we have the velocity for the P wave being related to the Lame parameter, lambda, plus 2 times the shear rigidity over rho. And the shear wave velocity, V sub S, is equal to the square root of mu over, or the shear rigidity over the density, mu over rho. Now, it, it may seem a little bit counterintuitive if you increase the density, you normally think you'd have a harder rock, and, and that's, um, that, that's, that's easy to appreciate. However, think about the shear wave velocity, for example. If we have a, a rock which is, has you know, considerable porosity, for example, and it's filled with fluid, its density is going to be greater. Now, if we remove the fluid from that pore space, then we're decreasing the density. So we decrease the density, we increase the shear wave velocity. So if you think about it in those terms, uh, pore filled versus um, uh, not, you know, having just um, uh, a gas filling the pore space, then this, this does make sense. So uh, next time around we're going to take a look at uh, relationships between the applied pressure P and the delta V over V, the change in, in volume with respect to the initial volume. So thanks again for joining us and I um, uh, hope to see you next time.